Okay, welcome to class today. We've got this short week with Thanksgiving, and I'm guessing a lot of people will be gone on Wednesday. Because of that, I, I feel passionate about this topic, but this was a weird week anyways. So I thought we'd plug it in. If you can't make it on Wednesday, we will have a reading quiz and stuff. But it is important I want you guys to know that this content won't be on the final. Right? I'm not going to put a final exam question based on sustainability. I think you should care about it because we're human beings. We live on a planet that we all share, so we should learn about this stuff. But this won't be on the final. So if, you know, if you've got family travel or whatever else for Thanksgiving on Wednesday, you'll miss a few clicker questions, but that's about it. Okay, so let's talk about sustainability. Hope everyone had a chance to do the readings. Um, God, there was even more. I had, my TAs all came up with such great ideas. We're going to start with a few clicker questions about the readings, right? And we'll do some more next class. The first one says the following. The article about farming in the Netherlands claims that sustainable agriculture, A, is not a realistic goal, and that other areas of sustainability should be focused on instead. B, it means letting nature return to a state where humans have little or no part in agriculture. Or C, that it's possible by cultivating healthy soil, exploring GMOs, using insect protein for animals instead of plant protein, instituting hydroponic growth, and other novel technologies. Okay, get your answers in. Okay, we're wrapping this one up. Okay, is it possible? Should we let nature take over again? Should we try and do it? Yeah, okay. Pretty obvious there. They, they put forward the argument that it's mostly possible. Somebody wants to return nature back to the way it was. I feel ya. All right, how about this one? The Dutch researchers are studying uh, sustainable agriculture in all of the following ways, at least according to the article, except breeding and testing seeds for germination rates, environments, and pest resistance, handheld soil testing devices to monitor pH and organic matter, cultured meat, also called in vitro meat, or meat grown in cell culture instead of inside animals, and then last one is using other insects to combat pests and crops. Okay, answers in. Gonna wrap this one up. Okay, yeah. Cultured meat, that is a big deal in the world, but that's not one of the articles specifically talked about that the Dutch are working on. There's a name for the company that makes these. It's um somebody remembers it. It's pretty amazing. They've made a they've made an artificial meat that they grow in a in a petri dish that bleeds, it cooks, it's got the texture exactly like regular. It's pretty wild. Okay, <clears throat> last question on the reading quiz. The materials cycle, as discussed in this chapter, should be thought to consider A, mostly how materials are created, mostly how they're used, mostly how they're disposed of after their use, or all of the above. <laughs> Okay, ending the poll. Answers in. Okay, yeah, these are definitely all important. Okay, so let's talk about some of these things. And maybe the first place to start in a chapter about sustainability is what we already know. Um, a few years ago, I knew nothing about sustainability. It's not a word I ever even used. And if I thought of it, I probably would have thought like, oh, sustainability is just designing or 
making material so you can just keep on making it. It's basically not picking something that's going to run out, right? So if there's X amount of some element or commodity, realizing that there's, a, there's an end date on how much I can use of that if I'm using some every year. I think that's what I thought sustainability was, right? Maybe you guys shared that thought coming in before you did some of the reading. Um, in fact, we're going to learn that it depends. it's actually way more than that. And there's typically what the, the most common way to teach sustainability is the three pillars of sustainability, where one of them is economic, one of them is ecological, and one is societal. And the whole idea behind it is that every time you make a decision in engineering or really anything, it's going to impact those three things, right? Or you should at least consider the potential impact in those three things on the, on the economic impact, on the environmental or ecological impact, and then on the societal or what it's going to do to people in their lives, right? So I think that many of you guys, when you get jobs, after you get this degree, you're going to go out and your boss, um, he or she is probably going to care about what? The bottom line. Economics, right? They want you to make the best product that will make them the biggest profit. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. I mean, that's driven a lot of amazing innovation. But if that's all you care about, I hope by the end of this class you realize that you're missing a bigger picture and you should be considering other things, right? So let's start with the simplest one. This is the one that your boss is going to care about. See if this works. So I'll switch this out. Let's talk about economic cost. So when you design a new material, right, when you come up with a new product, the cost is coming from three things. It's coming from the design itself of your product, it's coming from the materials that you choose to use, and then you manufacture techniques. So let's start with component design, right? Um, I think this is, at least in material science, this is one that we care the least about. We usually think just about the materials and maybe a little about processing. But let's talk about cost as it relates to component design. So I want you to turn to a neighbor, brainstorm who or what is involved as you design some new component, whether it's a new iPhone or whatever else, right? Who or what is involved, what constraints are there, and think in terms of cost. So take a few minutes and let's dis discuss that. Okay, let's, let's start brainstorming these. So who or what is involved in the design process? Who's got something for me? Who's involved? Thomas, what do you got? Okay, researchers, developers. Who else? Who else is involved in this? Jeff? Graphic artists. Yeah, graphic designers and artists. Who else? Rob? Sure, yeah, like the... Uh, Everything that, like the tools we use, exactly. the use. Um, and the person who invented the graphic design program. Sure, yeah, right, all that goes into it. That's not something that, well, you kind of do indirectly pay for that. How do you, pay, how does that affect cost? Somebody else doing something that you don't do, how do you pay for that? Yeah, you buy the software, right? So you're paying for it one way or another. The pen is not working, which makes me real sad. Sorry, we'll just type things today. Yeah, so people who made the tool, so you have to buy software or the manufacturer of that tool. Yeah, uh, Zach? Sit one more time. People that enact the legislation. So the legislation around it, absolutely, that's going to affect cost. What else? Who else influences this? <clears throat> Is there anybody else? We made a, the list last year is much longer. Consumers going to influence this, right? Who else? Yeah. The assemblers or the manufacturers. Yeah, you got your designers or developers, but they're not the ones making it typically. You've got the team actually making these things. Hand, was it Matt Johan? Marketing, absolutely. Marketing and let's say sales, kind of put those together. Yeah, Rob? So uh, whoever designed the factory that gets money back from it, depending on how efficient yeah, the like, is. So the infrastructure, wherever that came from, infrastructure. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, raw materials. Providers, 
for me, that's Sigma Aldrich and Alpha Azar. We give them tons of money every year to buy our materials so we don't have to make them ourselves. Rosa? Yeah, you got to move things around, transportation. So this is in the design phase, a little bit less of that. Some of this is actually bleeding over into materials used, right? But that's fine for now. Anything else? Just think in the design phase. Who's designed something? Anybody come up with a product before as like a business competition? If you haven't, Utah's the place for this. I don't think you people realize what a big deal it is and what great resources we have here. The Lausanne Studios, Get Seated, Bench to Bedside. These things aren't everywhere. We have amazing resources. Anything else that we're leaving off on this process? Jeff? Sure, you might need consultants, um, right? Something that you don't do yourself, but you might hire somebody to do to tell you something, right? We all do this when we buy homes. You hire a consultant to do a house inspection, right? The title companies require it because they don't want to give you a loan until they know what the house is worth sort of thing. Rob? Prototyping costs. Prototyping costs. So that could be engineers. Yeah, materials for Let me hang on to that for a minute. What about patents? Are patents important? Or Matt, do you have a thought? Well, we clearly need some material scientists. Not what I was looking for. I was looking for HR, something we forget about because we're all technical and we're like, you don't need HR, you don't need human resources. We'll just start doing stuff. Like, no, you need, you need human resources. So you need human resources. And that's actually a significant part of your overhead. And then patents, right? You're probably not patent attorneys yourself. You haven't. You probably don't want to be defending it yourself because you could go. You could lose a lot of uh, money by having a bad patent written, right? So you're gonna you're gonna hire people out on there, right? All right. What constraints do you have when you're designing something and you're thinking about the bottom dollar? What constraints come to mind? I heard two things. One was what now? Environment. Okay, the environment. What do you mean by that? Okay, the environment where it's going to be used or built. <coughs> okay, I like that. Uh, Elise? Yeah, can it be mass produced? Right, is this going to be like a one at a time or, or not, Takara? Cost. Cost of just. Okay. How much you can spend? Okay, yeah, like uh, what are your margins? Right, you basically know what consumers are willing to pay for it, so how much margins? So you know how much you can actually build around? Yeah. Uh, is it Ali? Yeah, what was the name? Or what was the uh, idea? Regulation. Regulation. That's a really important one, right? <clears throat> is if you're, divine, if you're designing like a window on a car, are there regulations on fracture toughness, on impact resistance, on, on transparency, right? You have to know these things. That'll influence it. Did you have one? Yeah. Uh, size. Yep. Size. You could say weight the same way, right? Is it going to be too heavy or not heavy enough? Uh, Brandon? Uh, uh, manufacture maybe yeah like what do you do with that is it going to be expensive to get rid of it can you reuse it Jeff yeah properties property requirements right Ryan availability you guys are thinking way down the line just in the design phase what about like timelines right <laughs> it's going to be made on some sort of timeline what about things like safety Right? We've been talking about fracture, toughness a lot in this class. What about tolerances, right? Does it have to be to a, like a thousandth of an inch or is like a tenth of an inch good enough? Like it depends on what you're talking about, but tolerances are gonna influence cost. What else, anything else going in mind? Or like conflict materials. Conflict? Yeah, like conflict zones. Oh, okay, yeah, absolutely. What about intellectual property, right? You have to think about what other people in the field have done and how you can get around that basically. Yeah, Anders? Marketing, yeah, how easy is it gonna be to market or not? Anything else that we're missing here? Yeah, Rob? Yeah, I'm gonna leave that with mass produce, but that's exactly something you should consider. So there's a lot there, right? This is an incomplete, both of these are incomplete lists. We could probably go on and yet look at all this just in the design phase. There's a lot there to consider. And so a lot of your jobs, I think as engineers, we tend to do mostly design. We do some material selection for sure. We do maybe some manufacture, but I think most of your nine to five jobs will be related to these things, right? And how you can engineer your product to better fit these constraints and these sort of things that you're trying to minimize or maximize, right? So let's shift gears and talk about materials. We've talked about some of this already. What about materials when it comes to cost? What comes to mind? We've already said transportation. Light, does it does it come near you? Do you have to have ship it to you? Is that gonna be expensive? 
What else though, when it comes to material side of things? Brennan? Just the total volume available. There's not a lot of material. Yeah. A couple of years ago when, when Elon Musk released his power wall, did you guys watch this? Is anybody else a nerd yeah. like me? I watch everything he puts out, right? So he, he he released the power wall and he's like, We're gonna put the whole we could put the whole planet on this and here's what it would take. So I did some calculations because resource availability is a big part of what I'm interested in. And there's actually not enough lithium on the planet to make batteries for our current power demands, right? So if you reduce our power and energy requirements, then you could talk about it. But right now there's just not enough lithium on the planet. So I don't think they've done that analysis, right? Or maybe they know of lithium where I don't know it exists, which is, I don't know where that would be. John? So we'll talk about that later today with planetary resources, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, is there enough of your thing available that you can even do this? What else with materials? What else is gonna dictate cost? In the way back, Zev? Oh, purity, that's a big one. We pay a lot of times, if you're, if you're doing a, if research on say optical materials or something where tiny amounts of dopants can massively change the transparency or the other properties, and you're, pay, you're paying for like 5.9 purity, so 99.999% pure, man, you're gonna pay a lot of money, right? Even basic things like copper, iron, those can get really expensive if you want high purity. If you're okay with lower purity, you can bring costs down. Rosa? Let's leave that to manufacturing, right? Let's talk about processing in a minute, right? Brendan? I, I talk about the safety of the materials, but I don't know what the cost Yeah. I mean, for example, in the European Union, you can't make most consumer products with lead in, in it anymore. It used to be you could have lead, but it had to be encased and covered. They just, in very few instances, are you allowed to even use lead at all in, in the European Union right now. Lead wallpaper paint used to be pretty common things. Now we've decided those are not safe enough. We don't want them, right? With good reason. What else? What else will influence it? Um, I've got environmental concerns. What if while you're making something, you have to have scrubbers, right? You Your process gives off lots of SO2 or NO2. You're going to have to pay to scrub that because now EPA, rightly so, is saying we shouldn't just dump crap into the air. We should think about what's going into the air and set limits on it, right? Um, we already talked about waste. Let's list that again. What about packaging, right? That's part of the materials cost. You make your product, but like, there's an enormous amount of cost in the packaging. And who's bought a recent electronics device lately? The, tell me about the package. Remind me your name again. Alex. What is it again? Alex. Oh, in the way back. So that's Alex and in front of you in the red. Kobe. Alex and Kobe. Tell me about the product, product packaging. Right. Similar experience, Alex? Yeah, it's like a really, you know, well-designed box with a lot of like making it look nice. They and they look great. It has the impact that it's supposed to have. We like it as consumers, but like that's cost, that's waste, right? There's a lot of things that we should consider with that. Not just the fact that hey, consumers like this more, we should do it. You should think first off: is are we spending more on this than we're getting out of it? And is there an ecological impact that we should care about? And so forth, right? Anything else? Um, what about side products, right? You make something, but it produces something else. We deal with that in my lab. We make things, but we make a lot of acid side products, right? You've got acid with like partially dissolved crap in it, right? So that's not great. You've got new versus, <clears throat> new versus used. Can you start with something that's already out there or do you have to uh, start with something brand new, right? Yeah, Matt? It's labor material. <laughs> I wouldn't think, I'm going to put that down in manufacturing with processing, we'll come back to that. So I wouldn't call that a material. <laughs> okay, There's, I think we could go on, right? What about toxic, we already said toxic, right, safety. What about rare things, right? If you're designing and you're using diamond, right, it's going to get real expensive real fast. It might be the best material in terms of materials properties, but it's just, it's way too rare, right? So think about the, the rarity or the cost of materials in and of themselves can be important. Okay, let's talk about manufacturing. Manufacturing, you've got to break it into two categories. You've got your primary manufacturing, and think of that like that gets you something close to your final product, right? Going from raw materials, whatever your raw materials are, to something that looks like final product, and then your secondary, which brings you close to the final of your final product, right? So it's the final machining, right? So raw materials, you've got processing. That's a pretty vague term, labor. Labor should go there. What else is there in, pro in, a, in your primary manufacturing? Yeah, uh, Natalia? Okay, yeah, that's a big one. Energy costs. Are you making your own cost, energy? Are you taking advantage of some natural resource? Like in the, uh, the plant uh, article you read about the Netherlands, where, how are they heating their green home, the greenhouses where so much of their stuff's grown? 
said half of the Netherlands has geothermal resources, right? So they're getting a lot of that for free. That's something that's going to come into your equation for sure. If you had to pay for that yourself, that's going to get really expensive. Brennan? Uh, the time to process Yeah, time and like storage, right? If you've got a rate limiting step and that's what's slowing your process down and all your stuff has to pile up while you wait for that, you have to pay for somewhere that to be, somewhere to watch it, somewhere for it to be air conditioned, whatever it is that, that might have costs associated with it just sitting there in your factory, you're probably paying for it just being there, right? What else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is it an industrial line where it goes from machine to machine to machine? Or are you having to manually move things around a lot? What else? What other type of manufacturing things are there, David? You have like quality control. You need people to make sure that the products are. Yeah, that was my dad did. He worked for a medical device company in Ogden. Did quality like that's all he did was make measurements, make sure that it was coming out. You know, and it's it's doing dialysis. You want that thing to work, right? So you got to pay someone to do that, make those measurements, or you have to buy a machine that's going to do it for you, right? That's out there. What else? Yeah. Training. Training, software, both of those are going to be in there. What are the tools we use? What tools do we use when we manufacture things? CNC always comes up. 3D printing increasingly is what we use. What else? Drills, right? Tools, right? All that's there. You've got like, gosh, we could go on and on and on. There's a ton there. There's the overhead associated with that. You've got to have a place for those things to exist, right? So all this is influencing costs. There's a ton there. Rob, more? Yeah. All right. What about uh, secondary manufacturing? Are there key things that are different there? One of the big ones is abrasives. You make something, whether you cast, like let's say you're making a new wrench or something. When you cast it, it's not going to be perfect. You're still going to have to machine that, right? So abrasives and machining is going to be very, very expensive. What else is there in secondary machining? What was that? Paint. That's a big one. Painting, a ton of cost goes into paint. What else? I think I put quality control there actually. QA probably goes in secondary. Hey, Rob? Yeah, heat treatment. If you have to do some sort of, you, it looks like your final product, but you've got to heat treat it to get it to have the properties you want. Yeah. Outsourcing, okay. Where maybe you're not willing to do that, but you're going to pay somebody else to do it for you. That happens a lot. Painting and stuff. If you're the expert in making it, you're not necessarily the expert in getting it painted or whatever. Yeah, Ryan? Uh, coatings. coatings, other coatings. <clears throat> right, anodized aluminum, right? This is now common on everything that's aluminum. We anodize it like crazy because it's better, it's harder, it's, but it costs money to do this. Yeah. Okay, yeah, in terms of performance, yeah, I like that. So it, it, it now looks like the final product, but you're going to have to maybe upload software onto it or tune it in some other way. Haley? Assembling costs, right? You got all the different pieces, it's got to come together, the packaging can go there too. Okay, let's do one more, Jeff. Packaging. Yeah, packaging. Let's do uh, under the bind real quick. Packaging and what else? Like repair. That's it. okay. Yeah, and keeping the, the 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 whole factory maintained. Yeah, there's a lot of maintenance costs there. Maintenance. Okay. Okay. So we could go on, right? There's a ton that affects cost just in like designing materials, picking what materials we're going to use, how we use them. And up till now, we've only been considering the economic costs, right? We have briefly kind of alluded to an ecological cost, right? We put scrubbers in power plants because we don't want acid rain. Because acid rain has an ecological cost, which translates to economic costs, right? But up till now, we've been doing economic, right? One of the big things that factors costs, I think Natalia or somebody said it, was energy. Energy is huge. If you look at where energy comes from and where it goes, we have this complex spaghetti diagram. It doesn't matter if, you don't, if you're not able to read all of it. What it's showing you on the left-hand side is where energy is coming from. This is in the United States as of 2012, right? Most of it right down here is petroleum, biomass, coal, natural gas, geothermal, and then this small section up here would be from those things. And the thickness of these lines tells you how much we're getting from those, right? So this is a really thick line here, so most of our energy we're coming from is from petroleum, right? Very small lines up there by geothermal. Solar is tiny. I mean, we see solar everywhere, it's visible, but we're not actually getting a lot of our power from it in terms of the total power we use. So these lines go towards the right, and as they go towards the right, they're talking about how it's being transformed or used, right? So you can see some of it, 26.7, whatever this is, quads or whatever that unit is of energy is being used for transportation, right? Mostly from petroleum, 
right? You're not using solar to get here, right? There might be some minuscule fraction of solar going towards that, right? Industrial is taking up about a third, basically, right? When we manufacture things, that's industrial, right? Then you've got commercial and residential. Of these processes, some of those turn into energy services, like making the drill run, heating up your home, whatever it is, and about half of it is rejected as waste heat, right? Is that shocking? That, that was, when I first learned about that, that's shocking, right? There's just kind of efficiency, right? Some of this we can't get around. We know you guys have taken thermodynamics, know that there's engines can only ever be so efficient depending on your input and output temperatures, right? But a lot of this is just waste heat, right? So this sort of diagram I think is interesting to look at in terms of where energy is going, what are we using it for? And I think it's important to realize how much of it is going towards industrial processes. So when you design something, if it's very expensive energetically, that has a real impact because that energy has got to come from somewhere. We have to pay for it. As we approach the year 2050, there will be 10 billion people on this planet, which means just crazy things in terms of how much we're going to have to uh, find new resources, right? Something that I've done research on is on crustal abundance and the availability of materials, right? So for example, we've got our periodic table, we've seen it a million times in this class, and we kind of treat it like it's just a playground that you can pick and choose from there and it's all this stuff is available. But the fact is that some things are certainly way more available than others. So something we built is a website that allows you to calculate how available things are in real time, right? So you can go to, um, you know, right now on any one of these things and you can click on it, say beryllium, it'll tell you right now what's the abundance of it, right? In terms of PPM, what's the scarcity, which is just the inverse of the abundance, right? And then we introduced two new measures called HHI for production and HHI for reserves. HHI is short for the herfindahl hirschman Index, so some economists came up with it. What it is, is it's a measure of how concentrated a market is. Why do we care about that? Um, I think I've got some examples in the slides about that. So let me show you how we calculated this first off. So think of it in terms of supply and demand. If there's a lot of demand, but the supply side, there's just one person producing something, that's really good to be that one person because everybody wants your product and you're the only one who makes it, right? That's a monopoly. So that's good for you, but it's not necessarily good for the consumers, right? For the consumers, they could get a lower cost if there's multiple people producing that commodity and therefore when the people who need to use that commodity could buy it at a lower cost, right? So how we generated this for all the elements is we started with the USGS, that's the United States Geological Survey. So it's something that the United States funds and they basically for every commodity that's out there that's a raw material, they've paid people to figure out who's making it, how much are they making as a function of time, where's it coming from, right? How many people are making all that? So if you look at like say iron ore, here they're showing mine productions for two years, here they're showing reserves, right? So known like deposits in the ground that even though we're not producing it, we know roughly that they're there in these amounts. And they do it as a function of country. And you can see that some countries have lots and some countries don't have very much, right? China produces a ton of iron right now, right? United States actually doesn't produce very much iron. Really pretty small, right? We make about as much as Canada does. Pretty small, right? So what we did is we used data from that and we treated every country as an entity. And we, you take the market fraction that each entity has in producing something, you square it, and you add those up, right? So you're adding up all those things. So here, let me put it in terms of things that are more easily understood. So here's computer operating systems. You've got basically three options with computer operating systems. You've got Windows, you've got Mac, and if you're crazy, you're using Linux, right? Crazy, like brilliant, or crazy, crazy. It kind of goes both ways, I think, with Linux, right? That's your options, right? And Microsoft dominates. It's something like 90% of computer operating systems. So 90%, you're going to square 90%. You're going to add maybe the 9% coming from Apple, so 9 squared, and then plus maybe 1% from Linux, right? That's your herfindahl hirschman index. So that number, if you had 100% market fraction, it'd be 100 squared. That's going to be 10,000, right? That's the highest it can ever be. On the lowest end, let's say that something is like infinitely distributed, <clears throat> it can approach zero. So moving down from computer operating systems to smartphone operating systems to search engine tr site traffic, right? Google's the big one here. Social media traffic, I'm sure that's Facebook. Carbonated soft drink preference, shoe preference, right? Domestic airline down to vehicles. As you move towards the left, it's getting better and better for consumers because your options are becoming more and more available. So what we did is we said for different materials, for whatever application it is, for whatever new gadget, whatever it is, you can actually plot these on a, on a scale that will show you concentration, right? So on the x-axis is your HHI for production. It's telling you the concentration of who produces something. The y-axis is scarcity. 
So you want to be down low. Things like titanium, that's what most dirt is. Dirt is aluminum, magnesium, titanium. It's these common elements. Moving up towards copper, tungsten, silver, platinum, obviously that's going to get more and more expensive. So if, what, what we allowed you to do is we allowed for a simultaneously consider, uh, a simultaneous performance and resource consideration. You can plot things on this axis, which will show you resource considerations. If you're up here, that's not a great place to be. If you're down here, that's a great place to be. And then we said that the marker size for each one of these families of materials scales with performance. So big markers are great, but take a look at these ones at the top. Those big markers, those are for calcogenides, which are made of tellurium. So this is for the field of thermoelectrics. That's mostly what I work on. Thermoelectrics take heat, waste heat, turn it into electricity. These things are on average as rare as platinum. So it's stupid to work on them. Like why are we wasting our time on these materials that are never gonna get inexpensive because their tellurium is the ninth rarest element on the planet, basically. Is, this is the sort of things that we try to tell people in the field. Like if you do this resource analysis, it should direct what materials you choose to work on. You guys should care about this. If you're designing heat sinks, you're designing stresses, struts or whatever else, think about the availability as well as the scarcity of those materials. For example, Rare earths out here, these materials are, these pink ones, great performance. You've got some big markers, but they're very concentrated in terms of production. They're not actually that rare. They're about as rare as, you know, tungsten to silver. They're not crazy, but they're very concentrated, which can lead to cost. Meanwhile, you've got other materials like these ones here, these purple ones. Those ones combine pretty good performance. The markers are pretty big, but they're way more available, and they're very widely, uh, they're not concentrated in their production, right? So we put together a periodic table. For every single element, you've got three categories. The bottom one is abundance. The left and the right have to do with HHI. And you would love it if this entire periodic table was all dark blue. That would mean that it's great. It's available and everyone makes it so you can get it for low cost. But that's not how the world works. You've got some things which, like the rare earths, despite their name being the rare earths, they're not actually that rare. This bottom triangle shows you how abundant they are. They're kind of like medium to high, actually. They're actually not that rare, but they're extremely concentrated in production. Countries have them, like this right hand one is blue. Most countries have rare earths in the, in the dirt, right? If they wanted to dig them up, they could get it. But nobody does it because it has huge ecological impacts when you try and refine it. One country doesn't care, and that's China right now. Australia increasingly, and now the United States are actually starting to get in the game because rare earths are just enormously important. Why? Because of things like, um, Dysprosium and neodymium, that, those are rare earths. Those, I hope you've heard of those as magnets, right? A neodymium magnet, dysprosium magnets. If you have uh, wind turbines, how do you generate electricity? S magnets, solenoids, right? Magnets, you have to have strong magnets in there. In your vehicle, there's, I saw a diagram recently, it showed 14 different places where you have magnets in your vehicle. Anytime you have an actuator, like motors, these things are all actuators, they rely on magnets, right? So these are really, really important that we care about them. Josh, question? What was the white on the periodic? White was, you can't guess it. Technetium like exists for like milliseconds, so we don't guess anything about it because it's not a real material. Perm is, uh, this one, PM. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what that is. I don't know what that actually is. Anyways, and some of these rare earth, uh, noble gases, I mean, you don't actually use them for anything, so we left them off. It means we don't have an estimate. Yeah, Rosa? That's a great question. We haven't cracked the code on that. Some things we know that, like nuclear decay, if you start out with uh, like uranium, right, and you're making uranium for fuel, we know that as it decays, it does turn into other things, but we have not figured out how to just dial up any material, or any element that we want, right? We don't know how to take two carbons and join them to make, you know, whatever, two carbons, I don't know if it's silicon, whatever it is, right? We haven't figured out how to do that yet. Yeah, Brendan? Also, fusion makes a lot of energy. It also takes a ton of energy. And there's also byproducts like radiation, which you may not be happy about. Good question. Alchemy, they've been trying to do it for thousands of years. We haven't cracked the code yet. All right. Um, let's, let's return to these rare earths. What we plotted here, this I think is a, a good illustration on why you should care about concentration of who's making this element. So I've plotted here on the y-axis the percent of the January 2008 price. So whatever the price was there, if it goes up or down, we're saying it's going up or down based on that price. And then year shows you what's happening. So something around 2011 happened, like gold didn't change. So it's not like there was like an increased demand in production of all things that year. Something specifically happened to those elements that year. So what happened was what, anybody know the story here? What is this 
dysprosium and neodymium, those are two rare earth metals. And they were expensive to start with, but they went through the roof, like a 2,000% increase. That's crazy. So what happened is that year, China decided that, hey, they wanted to make wind turbines. They wanted to make all the things that we're making, and they need the rare earths to make those too. So they put an export cap. They said, we're only going to export 20% of our production, right? Which caused huge speculation, right? So this is not the, this is, an, this is absolute speculation. This is people in the stock market saying, hey, this is a commodity that is really valuable. I'm going to buy it because I'm, I'm betting that it's going to get more expensive as more and more people realize it's important. In the year 2012, they took this case to the World Trade Organization. China lost there, and they had to basically remove their export tariffs. But this is why we ought to care about that. If you're a company that was making turbines in the year, I don't know, 2010, you started your company, things are looking great, you hire a bunch of people, and then all of a sudden 2011 comes along, you're completely hosed. You're just completely out of luck. You cannot afford these costs, right? So it'd be way better had you chosen a material on this diagram for whatever your technology is, something way down here. Because if one country says, I'm not going to play ball anymore, and it doesn't have to be countries, by the way. These can be manufacturers, right? These can be companies or whatever else. If you're picking something that's only coming from one provider, you're just opening yourself up for uh, problems with, with scarcity and criticality. Yeah, Zev? Absolutely. It could be a lower cost material or it could be a more available one. So right now, non-rare earth magnets is a big research area. In the field of material science, uh, the Department of Defense, for one, Department of Energy, they both are funding lots of research on alloys that are great magnets, you know, as good as the rare earth ones are close to it, but don't have rare earths in them. Not because rare earths are, are rare. We know that they're everywhere, but there's problems with criticality there, right? And getting up to speed to start producing them is a decades-long process. It's actually very hard to do. Rosa? What do you mean criticality? criticality, that just means that even though it's available uh, in terms of abundance, it's not available that you can buy it from somebody. It, or it's not available at a cost that you can afford. And there's lots of examples of this. Rare earths are just one. Another one is rhenium. So where's rhenium? R-E, right there. So it's this one. This guy is another one where it's actually pretty well distributed. Everybody who's got a copper mine, which is almost every country, they can produce copper, and one of the byproducts of copper is rhenium. Very small amounts, though. So there's not a ton of rhenium. It's actually very, very rare. But every single jet turbine engine in an airplane or gas turbine engine generating electricity, they have to have rhenium in them in pretty large amounts. And if you don't have it, then you're out of luck. So if you're a company like Honeywell or General Electric or uh, you know these different companies that make turbine engines, they actually stockpile rhenium and they're desperately looking for ways to both recycle it or just avoid it. If you can make your turbine engine alloys without the rhenium, beautiful. You're in great shape, but that's just not the world we live in right now. So they're looking for solutions. Yeah, in the map, uh, hack, uh, I forgot your first name. Hack, something Haglock. Landon. Landon. <laughs> So, so I was just wondering, like, what, what does rhenium uh, add to So it has to do with the grain boundaries. It so when you do turbine engines, it's a, it's a nickel super alloy, and they're pretty amazingly designed materials. But if you don't add the rhenium, it's something about pinning grain boundaries and stopping them from growing too large. You guys just learned about hull pets. You know that the larger the grains, yield strength goes down. So it does something to pin the grain boundaries, but I don't remember the exact uh, offhand. I'd have to look it up. Okay, so we've introduced the case on why we should care about how much of these elements there are, where they're coming from. There's a lot more though, right? Let's talk about, um, in addition to the economic considerations, which is the main thing we care about, let's talk about ecological and societal impacts. One of the things to do that is to introduce this cradle to cradle or life cycle analysis. And this is fundamentally a different way to think about materials. Rather than saying, I buy my copper from Kennecott, they dig it out of the ground, I put it in a heat sink that goes in a computer, which lasts five years, and then a consumer doesn't want it anymore, and it goes to a dump, and I'm done, and I keep, I just start over, right? That's the old way of doing it. That's cradle to grave. Instead of doing cradle to grave, you want to do cradle to cradle, right? So again, you're starting where things come from, right? So they're coming from somewhere. Raw materials come from somewhere. That could be plants. It could be you're digging out of the ground, whatever it is, right? You turn it into something, right? organic and synthetic materials, right? You manufacture it into some sort of widget, some sort of product, right? People use that and Cradle to Cradle says, how great would it be if you could then from consumers get them to turn it in, you could use some, you could do some other synthesis step and you could manufacture this again over and over. This is basically recycling, right? This is, there's nothing groundbreaking here, 
But even though it's nothing new, engineers have neglected to design for this. What do I mean by that? Take, let's go back to our magnet problem. In a car, there's like 14 or 15 places where magnets exist. They're tiny and they're like boxed in really complex uh, housings, right? So if, even if you wanted to recycle the magnets out of cars, it's a pain in the butt. You have to pay somebody to chop into all 14 different spots, pry these things open, try and identify what's the magnet and what's other stuff because they look kind of like metals, right? So we don't design for it very well. So something to have in mind is we ought to start designing in a way that things can be easily recycled, right? Not something that is considered very often, right? Or even better, what if you don't take raw materials that you're going to dig up once? What if you take things that can just be grown over and over again, right? Organic precursors that can be uh, uh, used continually. Um, again, and one of the reasons why we have to think about this is because right now the Earth is a closed system. Somebody mentioned this, uh, John or somebody mentioned that people have thought about ways to get out of there. So if you click that link, it'll take you to asteroid mining and the, the companies that are talking about doing that. But for now, what's on this Earth is pretty much it until we get creative on how to dig things up on asteroids, right? Um, and right now, we are extracting a ton of materials, 15 billion tons of raw materials. And some of these things we're actually running out on, right? Um, lithium is going to be a, a perfect example. Lithium batteries are everywhere. Now, every device you buy, notice this. I just buy them gifts for Christmas or whatever. Notice how many of them use conventional batteries, the old lead acid ones, or use the old uh, nickel hydrides or whatever else versus lithium. Increasingly, it's lithium everywhere, and we are just running out of lithium. It's getting going to get more and more expensive. It's going to have greater ecological impact than the stuff that we dig up. So we've got to think about ways that we can recycle the lithium batteries we have, because right now they recycle almost nothing. It almost all just goes to the dump, right? Lithium on batteries. That's going to be a big problem. Um, another thing to think about is how is the atmosphere, the, the ecology around your plant, your user, your dumps, affected by the materials that you choose to use, right? If you use lead wallpaper, we clearly learned that that's a problem for the people using it. But what about the people that had to make the, the wallpaper, right? If, you've, uh, if you're a nerd like me and you listen to a podcast, there's one called Science Versus. Where they talk about the impact. I don't know if you've listened. This is my favorite. So there's a plug for Science Versus. They did one on pesticides. And pesticides versus GMOs are these really that bad. And their sort of takeaways that pesticides currently aren't that bad. There's not a ton of scientific literature that says that they're killing us. But if you're the person that has to work with those crops, if you're the laborer who's spending day in and day out, you're getting much higher concentrations. That is a big deal for them, right? You could say the same thing for the people working with uh, materials that are assembling your iPhones or assembling your engine in your car or whatever, or the people that are disposing of them, the landfills, right? They could be really adversely affected. So it's not just the user you need to think about. It's the manufacturers and the final end of life there. Okay, we're, God, there's a lot more there. Let me skip past that. Let's talk about recycling. Um, maybe I think a, a naive answer to all these questions is, oh, we'll just recycle things. Everything can be just recycled, right? The fact is not everything can be recycled. And of the things that are recyclable, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the, the lowest cost option. And it depends on where you live, right? The lowest cost, whether or not something is viable to recycle, meaning you can do it and make money on it, depends on where you live. Out here in Utah, you have to think, okay, why do we recycle? when we've got all this empty space and we can just dig a dump and just no one has to go look at it. We've got big deserts, so who cares? Just go stick it in the desert somewhere, right? I'm playing a devil's advocate. I don't actually believe this, right? But that's a pretty good argument to make. Like, why should I charge consumers more money, right? Why should I raise taxes to, to supplement recycling programs when we can just go dig a hole in the desert, right? It's a, it's a fair argument, right? Um, it, now, that's in Utah. What about in New Jersey, right? New Jersey is like packed. Have a Long Island. You don't have big empty deserts. And so depending on where you live and the costs associated with disposal, your cost of recycling and the availability of uh, recycling is going to change. That said, there are some things that we can generally recycle everywhere. The main one is <coughs> aluminum. Pretty much no matter where you are, you can recycle aluminum and make money at it, which is why pretty much anywhere you are, they'll accept tin cans, right? Soda pop cans and you can recycle them. Why should we do it? couple reasons. First off, we will, even though aluminum is crazy, crazy, crazy abundant, you could always run out of it, right? That's probably not going to happen. The real reason why you should recycle aluminum is the cost of energy. It takes 28 times less energy to recycle aluminum and to purify it and get rid of the paint, whatever's on it, than to start with bauxite ore, which is, again, everywhere. So we should still do it. Um, other ones, also it reduces waste, right? So another reason, it's not just that we can do it and save some money or make some money, it's going to reduce waste, right? 
Um, another one, which it, it depends on how we can recycle it, is glass. Glass, the problem with glass, it's pretty easy to recycle. You just melt it and you can reuse it pretty easily. The problem is the competition is just so cheap. Digging sand out of the ground and turning into glass is already really, really cheap. So cost effectiveness is not really there. So most things you actually won't make money on if it's in the current marketplace. If countries and states start to charge more for having dumps, maybe because things leach out of that dump that influence us, we have to pay to remediate the water or whatever. I don't know exactly what it looks like. Then it could become feasible to recycle things at a lower cost. But right now, you're not generally going to make money on it, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't design around recycling for some of the reasons we've been describing. Um, other things that can be recycled or can't. So metals actually are one of the shortest, uh, they take the shortest amount of time for them to decompose, right? When we think about things go to the dump, what happens to it? Some things will be there, gosh, when, this, when the sun swallows up this earth, they will be here forever, right? Some things actually don't last that long. A lot of organics, grass clippings and stuff like that, you think bugs are gonna eat that, it's gonna turn back into dirt, but then you have to consider what does it look like in the dump? It actually gets driven on by giant tractors, Heaven help you if you put it in a garbage, if you put it in a plastic bag, it's never going to decompose, right? Because now it doesn't have access to water and and uh, and and bugs and air, oxygen, right? If it gets compacted in the in the dump, it's an anaerobic environment. There's no oxygen. If you dig down underneath dumps where all this trash is getting compacted, there's no oxygen. Oxygen is vital to most degradation processes, right? So dumps, even though we think like something's decomposable, like grass clippings, they can be there pretty much forever because there's no oxygen, right? Um, metals corrode pretty easily. They oxidize. Um, some of them are toxic, right, and shouldn't be landfilled. Some of those, if you do landfill them, they can dissolve into water. They, that water is going to go somewhere. It's going to go down into the water table where our drinking wells are coming from. It might run off into rivers, which will get into the oceans, right? This is why fish increasingly has high concentrations of mercury because mercury leaches right through the water into the ocean where fish gobble it up and it stays in them, right? Um, Something that you can do is oftentimes when you recycle metals, you have to separate it. Let's say that you, you've been doing all, as engineers, you've designed the perfect metal alloy, got the carbon concentration just right. When you recycle it, you probably want to go back to pure starting materials, right? Which means you have to do some sort of separation technique. Um, Kennecott, this is a picture of Kennecott's, uh, one of their plants, right? What you're seeing here is a bunch of electrochemical separation stations. So you have big baths of electrolytes. You put in... Uh, your impure copper anode. This is copper, but it's got other stuff in it that you want to get rid of. You electrochemically dissolve the copper ion, but not the other ones, so they crash out. They settle out, right? They sediment tip below it. And your copper ions, you then point them over here. So that's one process. You can do that for a lot of metals to purify it. So if you're, if you're recycling your aluminum cans and you got somebody thought they had aluminum, but it's actually steel, you're going to have to do some sort of separation of it, or you're going to have some alloy which has less than perfect properties. Tim or Thomas? I don't know with this one exactly. I think that they keep reusing it for some period of time, but I don't actually know that. Sam, it's a great question. Um, and I'll tell you what they do use with the stuff that falls off, the impurities. This stuff that sort of settles at the bottom that isn't copper. That's where your tellurium is coming from. These people that make thermoelectrics that use tellurium, it's from some tiny, 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 tiny trace amounts of tellurium and selenium and all this other gunk that's in there, right? So some of these are commodities you can turn around and sell, and some of it you might have to pay to, to get rid of. Okay, we talked about glass. Polymers, we've already said something about this earlier in this class, but when you turn any polymer over and it's got a number on the bottom, that number is telling you what bin to put that plastic in for the exact same reason that we can separate metals electrochemically pretty easily. It's very difficult to separate polymers. We don't have this electrochemical route. Maybe they have different melting points. They might have slightly different densities, but it's going to be really hard to separate plastics. Therefore, it's important to put them in the right bin. And right now, how do we do that? If you live in Salt Lake and you do recycling of plastics and stuff, it all just goes in one bin. And actually, a person is separating this by hand. So if you want to make a lot of money, come up with a clever way to separate plastics, right? Because that would make separating plastics easy and therefore low cost. That would make recycling better. That would be dramatic. It'd be a game changer. So there, it's not that there's no research happening here. I went to a conference that was talking specifically about recycling, and they had a machine, it's a conveyor belt, and it was looking at metals across it, and in real time they were doing X-ray diffraction, which we learned about in this class, and it was parsing out what materials were what, and in real time it had robots switching them to different tracks, right? Can we do it? Like, is it technically feasible? Yeah, it's just really expensive right now. So we need lower cost ways to do this. Okay, we're about out of time. So next class we're gonna talk more about this. Let me just leave on one last note here. 
if any of this has even kind of resonated or seemed interesting or seems at least like maybe I should care about this, can I recommend a book? And this book is really middle of the road. It's, it's written by a guy named Ted Nordhaus. It's called Breakthrough, Why We Can't Leave Saving the Planet to the Environmentalist. And just to tell you that this is middle of the road, both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times say this is a wonderful book. If you're familiar with these places, that tells you something about it. I think it takes a very pragmatic, pro-growth, uh, innovative approach to fixing some of the big problems that we face as engineers. Okay, next class we'll talk about some of the articles in detail and we'll have a discussion about it. So come ready to debate.